uh, I will be starting out tonight with our first presentation on uh, two astronomers of the month, uh, John Bayer and Nicholas uh, de, de Luis Lacay. I'm abbreviating his name here. And then afterwards, uh, Gus will be walking us through some stuff on binoculars. Uh, so uh, a little bit different for this, I ended up having to pick two astronomers just because one of them I really could not find much of any information about. And we'll go ahead and start off with him first. So John Bayer, uh, some of you might recognize Bayer if you've heard of the Bayer designation or the Bayer, uh, the Bayer star catalog. So John Bayer, uh, uh, really not much I was able to find on him kind of mysterious we, he, from uh, there wasn't an exact date for his birthday. We, he was born sometime in 1572 in Rhein, Germany. Uh, so German national, uh, part of the Holy Roman Empire during this time. He would die uh, on March 7th in 1625. So not quite a contemporary of Galileo, I believe. Uh, he I really could not find anything on him, it was, despite having one of the more significant pieces of astronomical publications underneath his name. He never married, uh, doesn't have any, did not have any children, and I could not find any relationships on who his parents were or if they uh, were uh, social status or anything like that. So it was great. He, um, at the age of 20, he would begin attending the University of, and I'm going to butcher this because it's German, of Ignolstadt uh, to study law. He was not an astronomer uh, by trade. It wasn't his main profession, which um, normally you would think of this time with the predominance of the Roman Catholic Church, it would be theology. Uh, so law, law is a bit of an interesting thing to crop up in these studies. Uh, there isn't any public, anything I could find on it, whether or not he uh, what level of degree he earned or when he completed his studies. Uh, just I just know he has a degree in law. And after graduating, he would go on to serve as a lawyer for the Osberg City Council. I, uh, I could not find how long that was, but it was likely until his death given, given the time period. Uh, so Bayer's only claim to fame for astronomy works is what's known as the Uranometria. It is significant because it is the first star atlas that covered both the northern and southern celestial sphere. Uh, so prior to this, most of it was still based off of the original 48 constellations documented by Ptolemaic back in you know the second century. And he added uh, uh, up to 60 constellations in total. Uh, and he, uh, some of them are still up there in his name. Um, they're, the 12 constellations he added are listed in the lower right hand corner here. Uh, some of them we'll talk more about later. Uh, so and prior, so prior, as I said, prior to this whole location, the all the star most star catalogs um, covered only the northern celestial sphere, which given the amount of exploration that was going on, because this is like beginning into the peak colonialization period, having accurate star charts for being able to navigate was very important. Uh, so having a complete star chart of both northern and southern was hugely beneficial for many works most of his he compiled a lot of this book based off of work from Tycho Brahe for the northern sky uh and the D Dutch navigators uh Petrus de Dory and Frederick Houtman who I think Houtman we've cropped up a couple of other times during our constellation of the month talks I might revisit him in a future date uh Though he would use information from those two navigators to help build his star charts for the southern sky. The, the in addition to that, he was uh, as part of his book, he would go on to catalog the top brightest stars in the constellation using a Greek or Latin letter. Uh, so this is where we get the now we know Alpha Centauri, you know, Alpha Persei, Omega Centauri, which is not a star, it's a globular cluster, which is an interesting discussion on its own. That's where all these designations come from. They were, uh, this is their Bayer designation, which as you know, many of us recognize from the names are still very much in use today. Uh, so so the, one other thing that I think was instrumental 
was kind of flip flopping back and forth when I was looking that made your Mon- your onometria so influential is that he would include pictograms representing the individual asterisms like we see today um, as as in the uh, avatars of the figure that the constellation represented over the con- over the individual stars like this here which is depicting the huntsman Orion so not um it was quite an interesting piece of work all on its own. And I th- we've talked about it many, several times over the last three years. So it, it, it is a very influential piece of work for early astronomers. And that's literally all I was able to dig up on him. So moving on to Nicholas de la Caille, who was a much more interesting figure in terms of things that I was able to find. He was born uh, he is a French national, born in Romingy, France, which is close to the Ardennes, in March of, 15, of 1750, 1713. I'm running all my numbers together. His pop father was Charles Charles Louis Lacay, and his mother was Barbie Rudry. And he had three brothers, five older sisters, and one younger sister. Only three of his sisters would ever would survive to adulthood. Uh, all, all of his other siblings uh, died young. So he was from a very well-off family. They actually owned the Chateau Cordepre or Cordepre in uh, in Osberg. So he was essentially a local noble. And his father was a very well-educated person. He was uh, originally a soldier in the military, and he would eventually go on to pursue. Uh, after leaving the military, would go on to pursue other interests with a very strong passion for mechanics and engineering. And he invented several devices, uh, but I could not find any information on exactly what devices he invented. Uh, But outside of that, his father uh, would go on to participate in two different projects, which would almost completely bankrupt the family. The first was a paper mill that he tried to go into, and that project collapsed underneath him. And then a second project was a colonial project in, uh, I think, a portion of South Africa, but I, the name escapes me and I didn't write it down. Uh, and that was abandoned early on, uh, which uh, further increased this debt. And that's a little bit important because we'll find out as we'll see here in a second. So as part of growing up, uh, Lakai would grow and to attend two Parisian you know, at, at universities. The collage de Mans. I uh, need to move the zoom thing. There we go. The uh, College of Seine and the College of Le I'm My French is very bad, so I'm going to butcher those. Uh, the second of these, he would only be able to attend because of a scholarship. Uh, and in both places, primarily studying rhetoric and philosophy. Again, kind of an interesting choice, but still a very popular topic for the day. Uh, while he was in school in 1731, his father would uh, died. I'm not quite sure um, of the cause, uh, which uh, left Lakai taking on all of his father's debt in order to protect his sisters um, from being and keeping them uh, safe. Um, and so this essentially left Lakai broke, penniless, and uh, without a home, uh, and very difficult to get into schooling without the help of one of his father's friends, uh, Louis Henry de Bourbon, who was able to help continue his schooling with financial assistance. So after, about a year after his father's death, uh, following the uh, wishes of his father had wanted uh, Nicholas to pursue a degree in theology and enter the church. Uh, uh, Kind of an interesting choice given the uh, not the Renaissance, the Reformation. So an, an interesting choice during this time period. Uh, but uh, uh, Nicholas uh, was very much uh, very uh, wanting to respect the wishes of his father and did enter, uh, uh, to the, uh, did pursue a degree in theology. Uh, but while he was at Navarre, he would go on to self-teach him um, himself geometry using uh, Euclid's elements, the, the default uh, geometry textbook for like 3,000 years. And through this, he would go on to gain an interest in math and astronomy, 
which would eventually take over most of his primary studies. He would still go on to complete his degree in theology, but he became a lot more interested in math and astronomy over the next few years. After graduating, he would go on to enter uh, the church as a deacon and would eventually meet Giovanni Cassini's son and his grandson, who would go on to further uh, Nicholas's uh, pursuits in astronomy. The Cassini family uh, eventually was able to land him a job at the Paris Observatory in 1735. While there, he would go on to collaborate with the grandson of Cassini, uh, Cesar, Cesar, on a survey to revise the French meridian. Uh, this is primarily for uh, navigational purposes, I believe. And uh, over the course of like three or four years, they would go out wandering the French countryside and taking measurements of the French meridian and publish their results in 1734 as a book who's um, the Meridian de France. Uh, but for some reason, uh, it's not quite clear why, uh, Cassini, Cesar, uh, Cesar Francois would only credit Lacai briefly in the preface, even though Lacai act was the one who did all of the math that was used to assemble this, this new work, which rubbed him in a very wrong way. Um, he, he was not happy about this, and he would eventually write several letters to various acquaintances trying to extol his work and, and try to make up for this just um, for what he felt was a slight. Um, but it's not quite clear from what I was able to see how this impacted his relationship with the Cassinis. Uh, but this work, despite uh, being underrepresented in this work, uh, it was important because it was one of two works, that is a typo, there was two works that Isaac Newton would use to confirm his hypothesis that the Earth was actually squished and is flatter at the poles. Uh, questions so far? Okay. So moving on from this work uh, with the Cassinis, he would eventually be appointed uh, as the chair, excuse me for the typo, uh, of mathematics at the College of Mazarin in Paris uh, in 1739. So this is slightly before the, the, his work with the Cassinis was actually published. And he would spend um, the rest of his professional career at the university. During this time that he would write many books, um, which I'm not going to list here. I, if you are interested in seeing what he published, I do recommend just going out and Googling them. Um, many of them were considered very influential for their time and would go on to be published in multiple languages, which is very unusual um, you know, considering how much it costs to print books during this time period because these are all metal etched metal plates that are used with the printing press, which is a lot easier for us to do today. Um, but they would cover a variety of topics from astronomy, mechanics, and engineering, and math. Uh, so very, very well versed. I, you would almost consider him a, a, a polymath in today's parlance. Uh, shortly after taking over his position as the chair of mathematics, the Academy of Science, the French Academy of Sciences would go on to elect him as an assistant astronomer uh, in 1741 when he was 28 years old. Uh, and uh, several years later, he would go on to be elected as an associate astronomer, uh, which is uh, considered a fairly prestigious position at the Paris Observatory. Uh, Using this influence, he would go on to request the Academy of Sciences to organize and fund an expedition to the Cape of Good Hope. Uh, this is where his the contributions that many of us as amateurs will come to know him by. Uh, arriving in location in the Cape in 1751, he would spend the next several years there cataloging roughly 10,000 stars. This was the largest catalog of stars for its time and impressive in such, and such. It's astounding that he was able to collect all of this data using, I think it was like a three-inch refractor uh, that was built at the at the, uh, at the Cape for him. Uh, this was exceeded the catalog that was assembled by Edmund Halley uh, by several thousand. So it was the largest uh, catalog of stars for its day. 
and Oma, a good chunk of these are still actually recognized by the catalog numbers that he designated. But I'm not quite, I didn't see what the, his name, his catalog was. I assume it, it actually still bears his last name of Lakai, but I do not know off the top of my head. In addition to that, he would go on to identify and name 14 additional new southern constellations, all of which he would go and name after instruments that were in, uh, uh, scientific instruments. Um, I have a slide coming up after this that will list all 14. And this is in addition to the 12 that were written in the Uranometria by Johann Bayer. So, um, but after returning from his expedition to the Cape of Good Hope in 1754, uh, he would continue working at the college, as I mentioned, at the College of Mazarin until he died in, at the age of 49. Uh, Interestingly, shortly after he returned, it is from Lakai that Edmonds, that uh, Halley's Comet would be given its name. He was actually the one who named it Halley's Comet after seeing some of Halley's work, which I thought was actually pretty cool. You know, it's one of those things where someone discovers something and somebody else names it. Uh, so for such an influential comet, it was like, huh. Uh, most of his work on the expedition of Too Good Hope would actually not be published during his lifetime because he died about eight years after he returned, which took a lot more long, longer to assemble the whole data. Uh, and so his catalog and his work from Good Hope would be published posthumously by Francis Bailey uh, in 1834, I believe. Should have wrote that down. Uh, his cause of death was attributed to uh, uh, joint ish, uh, joint pains, uh, which I did not actually know that this was possible, uh, called uh, uh, attack of the gout. Uh, so it uh, can be extremely problematic if left untreated. It is uh, also believed that one of the major contrib contributions to his death was just him overworking himself. Uh, today, he is buried at the College of Mazarin in Paris, France. And uh, for the list of constellations that uh, he officially documented and still bear their names today. Uh, this is the short list of all 14 of them. So, and that is the it for Nicholas Lakai. Any questions or comments? So, so he actually came up with these constellations or did he identified the, talked about them? He ident identified the asterisms and named them. Oh, okay. Um, but you do raise an excellent point in that I, I am not entirely clear if he was the sole identifier of these, or if there, or if he was building up to somebody else. But it, from the gist of what I would get, I got from the articles is he identified and named all fourteen of them. Okay. You, you mentioned the uh, French Meridian. I'm, I'm curious uh, how they did that. Is, is that essentially a, a surveying uh, project? It's an ex uh, that's an excellent question. And I'm not quite sure how they would do that. Presumably it, it would involve taking measurements of stars that's um, during the night or uh, addition to solar measurements during the day to try to get a sense of where high noon would fall would be my guess. Doing transit measurements. Mm -hmm. Okay. But it's an excellent question. Any others? So, um, um, Connor, there's only 12 listed here. Mm, I must have, I may have a mistake there. I'll have I mean, to go back and double check. I may I may have been to accidentally deleted something because of a copy and paste error because they these were um, these were actually the the names we now recognize them by some of them bear a slightly different name in his actual catalog and they were listed twice so it could be that some of these constellations were at one point two different constellations that have since been merged. Okay. Um, or I have a typo and I was uh, got over aggressive <laughs> in deleting things, um, which I'll. Presumably, you lean towards the ladder of me just deleting things I shouldn't have. 